In case you didn't know it, today is Palm Sunday. We don't usually run around with leaves and with sticks in our hands and wave them around. Today is a very special Sunday. This is the day when Jesus went, rode on a colt into Jerusalem. This is the day when everything changed. Would you bow with me? Gracious God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the celebration of your son. The reminder of the work that was about to be fulfilled. And how everything would be different. Amen. Amen. So this is the last of our sermons from based on Ellsworth's callous book, Seven Words to the Cross. Not from the cross, but to the cross. So our first word was a word of scorn. Those were the words that were shouted at Jesus as he hung on the cross by the roadside. People who were taunting as they walked by, shaking their heads, yelling at him, you saved others, save yourself. Words of scorn and of anger. Then we explored the late word. That was when Pilate finally got a little backbone and stood up to the ones who brought Jesus to be crucified. And so he finally stood up to them, but it was only to write a sign that said, what I have written, I have written, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Then we spoke about a word of indifference, those soldiers who gambled at the foot of the cross, who went through their gruesome and grisly tasks that they had to do because this was their detail. And as I think about and as I reminded us, when we are exposed to a constant barrage of awful and awful news and anger, we too become indifferent when we hear about constant deaths, when we see things around us that are anything but Christ-like, we too become indifferent, and we need to be careful of that. Then we spoke to the word of faith. Someone who was guilty, but in his last moments, spoke to Christ, one of the thieves hanging on the cross, and said, Jesus, remember me. Not a big fancy prayer, not any special words with these and thous, just Jesus, remember me. And Christ's words back to him today, you will be with me in paradise. Then we talked about a word of testimony who in the world would have thought that a Roman centurion, a man who was well respected and known for his strength and known for his command, would be the one to testify, the first one to testify to who this truly was, the Son of God. This man who walked with Jesus to the very last hours of his life and saw how he lived and how he endured what had been foisted upon him. And as Jesus sighed his last breath, recognized, in fact, who he was. And last week we spoke about a courageous word. You know, we, when we read the story about Joseph of Arimathea, you know, that the Joseph of Arimathea went and he asked Pilate for the body and he took him and he laid him in his tomb. We really don't understand the depth of what all that means. I mean, number one, Joseph of Arimathea was well, well respected. He was a man in the community. You would have seen him. You would have said, hey, Joseph. He would have said, hey, back. But he had enough stature in the community that he was able to approach Pilate. You know, you couldn't just walk up and say, hey, Pilate, how's it going? <laughs> you had to be someone who could actually get close to him. You had to be part of his inner circle of sorts. And here is Joseph of Arimathea, and he not only approaches, Jesus, approaches Pilate, 
He asked Pilate, he says, would you give me the body of Jesus? And I imagine that was an unusual command because as I told you, often they never even took time to do much with the bodies other than to toss them off the crosses to the side and let the wild animals deal with the remains. It truly was, Golgotha truly did mean a hill of skulls. But Joseph of Arimathea, who had been a silent, quiet follower of Jesus, finally worked up the nerve and became brave enough to approach Christ and, I'm sorry, approach Pilate and say, I would like the body of Jesus. Because he could not stand the idea of such disrespect to a man that he admired. And today in our sermon, we're going to talk about the futile word. Is it futile or futile? Yes. Either one. Got it. Futile is a good word, but I like futile. It kind of stretches it out a little. It's the south. It's, it's the south. It's, well, I'm from the south, born and raised. So it's going to be the futile word, y'all. But what does that word even mean? It means why bother? Why bother? What difference does it make? Why would we even care? And that's the point. If Jesus was just another man, then why was there the anxiety of the men who have brought Jesus to Pilate for crucifixion? Why was there the anxiety that something might happen? Why bother guarding a tomb? I don't know about y'all, but sometimes I get distracted in conversations. Any of y'all ever do that? <laughs> we'll be talking about something that's really interesting, and all of a sudden I am chasing rabbits in my mind. I'm hearing it, but I'm not really focusing on what's being said because I'm caught up in what I'm thinking. And I wonder for those religious leaders for those Pharisees as Jesus was placed on the cross and they started talking to themselves about what had happened in his life they started to remember things that Jesus had said along the way they started to remember things that Jesus did in his ministry now remember that Jesus had raised not just one, not two, we don't know how many people from the dead. Two incidents are recorded. But again, only a fraction of the healings and other things are actually recorded for us. Scripture says that if all the, all the miracles of Jesus had been recorded, there weren't enough books in the world to hold them. So imagine they were sitting around talking about, hey, we got it, we got him, he's gone. And then they start thinking, what was that he said in the temple the other day? Tear down this temple and in three days I will rebuild it? I wonder, was he talking about a temple? Well, you know, he did raise that little boy from the dead on the way to the cemetery. Well, and we saw all the healings. I wonder if he was talking about himself or what exactly was he talking about? And I think the more they talked to themselves and among themselves, the more distracted and distraught they became. And they began to worry and wonder, what was it that Jesus meant? What was it that he said? How was it? Was it possible? All these things that he had predicted, was, was it possible that would happen? So just in case, they went to Pilate. And they said, hey, Pilate. You know, his disciples, his followers, 
Jesus always predicted that he was going to rise after three days. So let's just, why don't you guard the tomb so they can't come and they can't steal his body and then tell everybody that he rose from the dead. Now, the tomb was secured by a giant round stone that was in like a trough. This stone weighed thousands of pounds. You and I could not move a stone. We saw some similar tombs when we were in Israel, and they were, I mean, the, the stones were taller than me and wider than my arm span. And yay thick. You know, I can barely pick up a 10-pound bag of sugar. How was, were these disciples, and now remember, where were the disciples? They were hiding. Last thing they were going to do was go anywhere and be around where they could be seen as followers because the crowd had turned against Jesus. The last thing they were going to do was go somewhere where everybody expected them to be and, and, and move the stone. I mean, I know that they were strong. Don't get me wrong. But that was not a, uh, the placement of the stone was no small act. It required men, strong men and levers to move this thing. But just in case those disciples came back, they said, Pilate, let's, why don't we guard it so that'll make sure that nothing bad happens, that they can't steal his body. Make the tomb secure. Futile words. How can any human stand in the way of an all-powerful God, one who has the ability to bring life? How can any human stand in the way of the resurrection? No words or efforts of humanity could bind the risen Christ. Now for centuries, humanity has tried to repress Christianity. They have done everything in their power to try to discredit this Jesus Christ. In Caesar's time, he used to have the Christians cast into the, into the arena with the lions to be torn apart as for sport. They said he even would light his garden with human torches. And yet, those who believed in Christ were not deterred. They would take Christians and they would put them in the slave galleys and have them row to North Africa. And then when, to, uh, to work in the mines, the Nubian mines. And they said that when they would get them off the boat, and they would whip them and, and drive them to the mines to work. They would actually chain them in such a way that they could never, ever stand upright again. And when they went into those mines and they had a mallet and they had a lamp to see, for almost all of them, that was the last time they saw daylight. And yet, when they go into the mines, one of the things that they have found written across the walls are prayers and the words vita, 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 which means life. Because no amount of persecution could take away their life in Christ, their passion about what they believed. In the 1970s, not so long ago, I know it is for some of y'all, <laughs> but for most of us who have memory of the 70s, that wasn't that long ago. The Soviet Union tried again and again and again to repress Christianity. But they couldn't. Today in China, if you want to be a Christian, you have to be registered so that you can go to the church and then there you will be watched. Underground churches are a real thing. Persecution for Christianity is a real thing even today. In 2004, I was blessed to be able to go to Cuba 
I was one of the, we were the first flight into Cuba directly from the United States. It was part of an evangelism ministry because Christianity finally came to Cuba, but you could not talk about it publicly or openly. You had to do it in prescribed areas where they told you you could meet. I remember I was sitting out on the balcony, not on the balcony, but you know, out on the little patio of the hotel trying to get ready because I was, I was one of the ones asked to preach while I was there. And I'm sitting there with my Bible and a man walking down the street got so excited and he came, I don't speak Spanish by the way, and he came up and he ran and he goes, Cristo, Cristo, Cristo. And I'm like, okay, I know that's Christ. And he was so excited to see someone in public holding a Bible. When people would try to give away tracts about Christianity, they would run and they would give them out and they would have to get off the buses before the guards saw them. Everything you did, or everything we did, and I think it's still this way today, is monitored with, by soldiers on every corner. What is said is listened to, what is done is watched. But here's the funny thing. All the repression in all the world couldn't keep Christ out of Cuba. Because you see, they would send in their spies to listen. The government would send in their spies and their spies would become Christians. And they kept losing their people to this Christ. So they legalized Christianity in Cuba around 2000 or so. But even in that legalization, it is repressed. You see, the light of Christ cannot be repressed. The resurrection cannot be held back. However, the biggest thing that can inhibit the resurrection is a life that is lived lukewarm. I remember when I came back from Cuba, it was, it was so strange because down there, every worship session was a party. I'm not kidding. I mean, y'all think y'all get it rocking? You ain't seen nothing. <laughs> Those people danced and sang. When they did their offering, and they couldn't give much, but what they gave, they would dance it down front. Not because they were trying to show up, but because of their joy. That at least within these walls, it was safe to be who it was that God had called them to be. And then I came back. I was so fired up. I came back to worship, and I was excited, and I was speaking to everyone. I went, For a long time. <laughs> and I thought, what is it? When did we lose our fire? And when did we lose our spark? When did going to church mean, I hope the choir sings the song I really like today? Or I hope the preacher isn't too boring? I hope she knows when to shut up and sit down. <laughs> she's already told us that more than once. When has coming to church become about us instead of about God? We forget that the songs that the choir sings, that the songs that we sing are not for us. It is about worshiping an almighty and an all-powerful God. We are supposed to come and we are supposed to present our best selves, whatever that is. When we give, we give the best that we can. And when we walk out of here, it is not to close the door and go on with business as usual for the rest of the week. Because when we live lukewarm lives, the world doesn't see Christ. They see convenience. They might as well be a member. Nothing against Rotary and Lions and all the clubs, because I belong to all of them. But we might as well be a civic club versus a place of transformation a place where you know that it is okay 
a place where it is safe to be known and to be loved. A place that really cares about you and who you are. When we leave here, we ought to be fired up. We ought to say, man, this was awesome. How can I carry this joy and this light into the world around me? How can I use this to make a difference? When we don't fully represent the love and grace of God to the people in the world around us, we seal the tomb. We stand in the way of resurrection and transformation. Friends, please, please do not let us be the ones to offer the futile word. The one that seals the tomb. Let us be the ones to shout of the joy of resurrection in our lives. Let us be the people that work to make a difference in the world around us. Let us be God's people in this place, in this time, and whatever way God has gifted us or place he has put us, let us be the ones to make a difference in the lives of others. Amen. 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 Amen.